late October, my girlfriend Stacy and I took a road trip to Stowe, Vermont. We rented a cabin on the website Glamming Hub, only about a 20 minute ride from the village. It was on a nice hilltop with a view of the fall foliage, which was just the reason why we took this trip. We had the rental from Thursday night to Sunday. The cabin had a code lock system. The owner sent me the combination before we arrived, and it worked seamlessly. Stepping in, we looked around the place, and it was nice and cozy. Literally everything was made of wood, and it had this very old-fashioned country feel. It even had this distinct smell that just reminded us of, well, I guess a country log cabin. There was a bathroom, a small kitchen, three bedrooms, and a living room. It was plenty of space for the two of us. There were two TVs, one in the master bedroom and one in the living room. There was this other door that was locked though, which we presumed led to the third bedroom that was listed on the ad. Though we didn't know why it would be locked, it wasn't a big deal at all, and we presumed the owner had some personal stuff in there. Plus, he knew it would only be us two. We put most of our luggage in the second bedroom so that we could leave the master bedroom nice and neat. Since we arrived pretty late on Thursday, we went straight out to dinner in town. Then we walked around the village for a little bit before returning to the cabin. By then it was late, so we called it a night after a movie. The next day was a cloudy, chilly one. We went out to hike along some dirt trails in the woods near the cabin, which was very peaceful. Upon returning to the cabin, I showered and changed out of my hiking attire and into more appropriate attire for hitting a nice restaurant. When I got out from the shower, Stacy told me she heard something in the bedroom with a locked door. She said it sounded like a radio or recording. I went up to the door and put my ear up on it to try and listen, but it was silent on the other side. I knocked on the door to the dismay of Stacy. She told me to stop because the idea of me knocking on the door trying to see if someone was in there freaked her out. To be honest, I slightly did it for that reason, just to tease her. While Stacy was in the shower, I was sitting in the living room watching whatever I could find on the TV. That's when I thought just barely, I heard the slightest sound from inside that room. I muted the TV and went to put my ear over the door again. I did hear this slight speaking noise, like it could be from a radio. I messaged and then called the host and told him about it. He said he wasn't sure why his wife would have locked the door, but that she may have left some of her stuff in there. He said as for the speaker noise, he'd have to ask his wife. Stacy and I went out for lunch after her shower. I didn't tell her about hearing the noise as well because I didn't want to creep her out, and it was obvious to me the guy's wife just left an electronic device in there or something. We went to this restaurant on Main Street in town called Harrison's. After that, we just took a drive around the area, then stopped at a park and relaxed for a bit. That's when the host called me and said that his wife told him she didn't lock anything in there, so he's not sure why that is or what we could be hearing. He offered to come by and unlock the door and check it out, to which I said sure. So with that, we headed back to the house. It was about a 20 minute drive back. When we got back, Stacy let herself in and collapsed on the couch, tired from my guests eating and walking around. I listened into the room again, and I still heard the same sounds from before. I said, hang on, I'll be right back to Stacy as I walked outside. I didn't know why I didn't think of doing this sooner. I went to the window to the bedroom with the locked door. There were no curtains or anything blocking the view inside. As I stood on my tiptoes to look into the room, I was horrified. I saw this grossly skinny, tall, 20-something-year-old guy in a hood dancing slowly in the center of the room. He had what looked to be a small radio in his hand. He noticed me quickly at the window and he stopped and looked at me, smiling. I started screaming Stacy's name, yelling get out of the house. She met me at the door panicked and confused. I told her just get in the car. I grabbed our two bags, leaving whatever stray items behind and threw them in the trunk driving off. I then called the host and told him to call the cops because someone was in the house. An hour later, while we were sitting in town, I got a call back from the host who said police arrived and the third bedroom was opened and no one was in there. However, they found multiple empty bags of chips under the bed, implying someone was in fact in there. We went back to collect our remaining belongings and worked out a refund between the host and the website. Of course, we didn't stay there after that. We went to a nearby motel and stayed till Sunday, then we went home. I'll tell you though, what I saw through that window, that dancing skinny figure, I couldn't sleep for nights, especially with the thought that he was in there the entire time we were, even while we were asleep. It happened after a long Friday night halfway through October, a rainy one, and drinks were involved. I was at this Halloween themed housewarming party with all my friends. 
I didn't wear a costume because I came straight from work already pretty exhausted. I took an Adderall to wake myself up before going and I stopped at a gas station to pick up some White Claws. There were a decent amount of people there, I'd say 25 to 30. I had to meet a few people that I'd never met before. All this socializing and drinking was keeping me awake, but deep down I kind of wanted to just get home and go to bed. Working in a hospital means I get crazy hours and my sleep schedule is all over the place. I eventually saw a good opportunity to do an Irish goodbye through the backyard. I didn't even really have it in me to say goodbye to 20 people. I really shouldn't have driven home with alcohol in my system, and I don't recommend anybody ever do that. Always call an Uber. I ran through the rain and got in my Subaru and just started to drive. No music on. I wasn't in the mood. I just wanted peace and quiet to listen to the rain hitting the windshield. Then, driving down some quiet residential road, I spotted a girl walking in the rain. No umbrella, no jacket, nothing. She stopped walking and looked at my car as I drove nearer to her. I definitely let out a sigh as I contemplated whether I should just keep going or not, and my more compassionate side told me to pull over. I rolled down my window and asked if she needed a ride. Without answering, she got in the back seat of my car. I asked her where she was going. She said just down to the end of this road, so that's where I took her. As I stopped at the second stop sign, I asked her why she's out in the rain. She said she was just in a hurry back and didn't want to call a cab. I said that's understandable, making a joke about how expensive cabs and Ubers are. I introduced myself as Jake, and she said, Allie, thanks for picking me up. After that, no more words were exchanged. I continued down the street until I saw a dead end sign approaching. I stopped at the final sign, then asked, is it past the dead end sign? She didn't answer. As I was halfway through that little intersection, I looked in the rearview mirror, and my heart sank. She wasn't in the reflection. I stomped on the brake and turned around. She wasn't in the back seat. I quickly pulled to the side of the road and got out. I hurried to check the entire back seat row. She wasn't there. Not on the seat, not on the floor. I looked down the empty road, lit up only by the occasional street light. There was no one in sight, but there was no possible way she even got out from the car, as I had not once heard the door either opening or closing, and there's no possible way she just snuck out from the car unheard. I was starting to question my sanity. I started feeling around the seat and floor where she sat. It was completely dry. It would have had to have been somewhat wet from her after being in the rain. I stood there in the rain, dumbfounded, confused and scared. I looked around me again, and then I realized to the right of the car, right next to where I pulled over, was a fence, and beyond that fence was a cemetery, and her response to my question moments before dawned on me, when I asked her where are you going, and she said, down to the end of this road. I looked at the cemetery, which was at the end of the road, then I got back in my car and did a three point turn and hurried home. I don't think I was anywhere near drunk enough to be hallucinating shit. Last October, my friends and I went to a haunted corn maze in Oak Hill, Ohio. It was supposed to be the best corn maze in our area. I want to leave the name out just out of respect for the family that runs it. I was with my friends Joe, Carl, and Cody. We always do haunted house type stuff every October. On the line to get into the attraction, we overheard some kids saying how last year the maze had to shut down for a night because some kid was actually hurt by one of the workers. We joined in on the conversation, and apparently someone dressed in one of the costumes actually pushed one of the customers and they had to close for the night. I guess that added a little bit to the nerves, like that maybe we'd feel like the costume actors would actually go above and beyond just the typical jump scares. Once we got in, it felt like a normal corn maze. It started slow, then, you know, the occasional actors would jump out from behind a corner or out of the crops. There were multiple speakers tucked away in the background, blasting spooky sound effects to add to the ambiance, and it overall was just littered with Halloween decorations and props everywhere. We came to this little split. There were two directions we could go, left and right, and there was a sign in the middle with two arrows. Left side said, this way to safety, and the right side said, danger, keep out. So, two and two, we decided to split up. Cody and I went to the left, the safety side. As we walked, we expected it to be the opposite of safety, that this side would probably be the scarier side or have more jump scares. Well, turns out that was right. 
kind of. We turned this corner, and there was this guy in a costume just standing there holding a pumpkin. The costume was very bizarre. It was an all-black outfit with this weird blank mask over his face. It was a complete pullover mask, but it only had two eye holes. No mouth hole, not even holes for the nose. He didn't jump out or make any screaming noises. He just walked up to us holding up the pumpkin, motioning for us to take it. We kind of just laughed, thinking it was part of the gimmick. Then, in a deep, raspy voice, almost like how Batman speaks in the Dark Knight movies, like he were masking his voice, he said, take it please. We looked at him continuing to laugh while moving forward, and he started to follow us, repeating himself over and over, saying, take it. Eventually, it seemed like it was getting a little stale though, like the joke was over and he should have stopped and went back to his spot, but he kept following us for over a minute. He kept saying, take it, take it, his tone getting angrier sounding. Then he said, take it or I'll kill you. Now, I didn't take that seriously, obviously, given that we were in a corn maze, but I did find it to be a little aggressive of a line. I took the pumpkin from him, and he seemed to stop following us. We continued walking until we bumped into Joe and Carl again at the point where the two separate paths merged, and they both laughed, asking why I was holding a pumpkin. I explained. Everyone agreed I should just take the pumpkin home with me at this point. Anyway, continuing on through the corn maze, it was a pretty traditional standard attraction after that. At one point though, one of the actors actually broke character and came up to me and said I can't steal the pumpkin. I told him one of the workers gave it to me, and he asked which one. I said the guy in the black with the white blank mask. He seemed confused and asked where the worker was. I told him on the left side of the fork in the path. He then walked in that direction not saying anything. We all thought it was really weird and took us out of the immersion a little bit. Quickly after that, we made it to the end, and it was only then when there was enough light that I realized the pumpkin was carved on the inside, and the top of it was cut. I grabbed it by the stem and pulled off the top, expecting something to be in there. And oh, there was. On the bottom of the inside of the pumpkin, at first I didn't know what they were. To be honest, I thought they were some kind of food, until I picked one up. I realized it was a severed human finger, a very real one. And there were probably nine more in there. On the side of the pumpkin was a pair of eyes drawn in black sharpie and under them said, always watching, with a smiley face next to it. My friends and I screamed and freaked out, and we ran to the nearest worker. She didn't know what to do either, as she was just as young as us. She called for one of her superiors, and he called the police. The whole attraction was shut down as police came and basically listened to our story. We stayed on the premises while police searched the place, but it was basically in the middle of nowhere, so he could have been anywhere. The police took the appendages for, I'm assuming, forensic analysis, I don't think a body was ever found to match the fingers. We left that place unharmed that night, but not without a permanently traumatizing experience.